Hmm. <laughs> so, today's going to be a really interesting presentation because it's based on a lot of um, a lot of research, and the presenter Simon Mundell is an absolute powerhouse. So, I'm going to attempt to recreate what he did. Um, with us in, in two hours at MIT, but it's going to come nowhere close because the guy's just crazy. He's just full on. It's just like my brain broke. Um, but it's an amazing presentation. It's, it's just having a look at the different things which actually cause a business to be able to execute correctly. And I thought it's a really great checklist for anyone that's trying to put together or manage a team. So the idea of this presentation is I've given you a checklist there, which you can see. We just call it Execution Essentials Checklist. Can you pass me the space? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to actually work through the execution of essentials assessment. And what I want you to do is have a think about either Griffin or your team or whatever team you want. I mean, you know, you could be thinking about your team in the DMO if you want. You know, you could be thinking about the bakery. You could be thinking about your hosts. But to think about your team and actually ask yourself, have we done these things with our team? What Simon's done is he's gone around and he's just figured out all of the things which are essential to a team having alignment in a rhythm and he's worked with all of the different people that teach us all the different things and he's figured out all those things and then he's gone and done some scientific research with a whole, I think, 3,000 businesses to actually check for best practice and see the businesses that are going well, which of these things look which way to figure out scientifically which are the ways to set up a team right, not theoretically, but just looking at businesses. So... What he did was he gave us a presentation and basically there's like 150 slides in this presentation. And the idea is it's just to give you a quick pass of everything because this is like probably a whole MBA worth of content. But he just likes you to be able to just have a check and give you sort of an overall overview of how to run a team and the key things to think about. Now, I wanted to run this session after the next session because I think the next session is more interesting. But this session is sort of preparatory and gives the context to the time management and execution stuff that I'll be teaching in the next session, which I think personally is probably a lot more interesting in terms of you can implement it in your life now, whereas this stuff is more very broad scale stuff, which you know when you're running a big company in 10 years time, you'll still come back to this session and go, do I have all these things done? So this is a really big overview, big picture thing. And then in a fortnight's time, we've got a really focused, okay, what can I do to make things work in my life right now? How can I organise my time in my life to work? So I hope you're up for it. Um, and I'm going to be asking lots of questions for you to think about and, and we're just going to try and move through the material. Is that okay with everyone? Um, so ask Simon if he could send me his presentation. He said, absolutely no way. But he said, I'll send you a copy of the slides that you can't mess with so that you can show them to your team. So imagine each slide is a, you know, we're going one, two, three, four, and we're just going to keep going down because he didn't want to give me the proper presentation because otherwise I could change it or give it to someone or whatever. So I'll just like hover over each slide as, as, we, as we go into it. So basically we're going to be looking at the cycle of business and the first thing that we're really going to have a look at is change, the concept of change. So this is what Simon was talking about so much is that there's only one thing that makes a business stable and it's the thing which is the least stable, and that's change. Um, he pointed out that almost all businesses that don't change don't exist very quickly because things change so fast in the business world. And that kind of seems obvious to say, but at the same time, it's something that people, once you're in a business, it's the last thing they want to do. So the hardest thing for the leader is to create an environment in which there is change, but the change is not scary and it's gradual and it's rhythmic and it makes sense. And so this is a lot of what today's presentation is about, is how do you create an organisation that can change quite rapidly, but at the same time not freak everyone out? So the first thing that he looked at was <clears throat> some companies that have failed to change. So how's the Kodak Film Company going? Anyone know? Yeah, that's not so good because of these things, digital cameras. Now, how are the digital camera companies going? Because this presentation was made a year ago. Yeah, awesome. They're also now saying it's a little bit. Yeah, how come? Yeah. 
This has a better phone than my camera from three years ago. My i my iPhone now has a better camera. It's a better camera than like a digital camera that you buy from the store. Um, so he had a look at CD stores. How how the CD stores go? Not so. But don't forget, five years ago, Sanity was a big company. It was a big company with big stores. Every you know Westfield shopping town had a big Sanity store in it five years ago, and that company is gone. It doesn't even exist. Thanks to iTunes. Who's watched a video lately? <laughs> Mm. Anyone heard of Netflix? Yep. 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 What is it? <laughs> you can download, you download movies off the Netflix. It streams it straight to your TV. And how's Netflix going? Pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. They're starting to struggle a little bit, not too bad. Yep, they're starting to struggle. Look why they're starting to struggle. Exactly. So this is the thing to think about is even these businesses that went, yeah, we beat Blockbuster Video, within you know, 12 to 24 months, they're going, oh, wow, shit. <laughs> Anyone been to Borders down in Rundle Mall lately? <laughs> it's good. It's good. Some good uh, empty space in the Borders store. Um, what's this? Yeah. Why would you go to the store when you could just download a book onto your computer? There wasn't so much ebooks in that case, wasn't it? More cheaper imports, like you would in Australia anyway. It's opposed to it's supposed to international. In Australia there's a bit of both. There's a bit of you can order books online real cheap and still and people are buying Come a significant that, amount that of seems to Kindle be books. more after yeah. after the crash really happened. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So borders couldn't respond to change. Do you remember what borders tried to do to try and compete and differentiate? In trying and um, get regulations Laws when they climb port overseas. Yeah. But that's going to something else which I thought was pretty cool. They opened up cafes in their yeah, bookstores yeah, yeah. and tried to turn, turn their bookstores into more of a like social place. So initially that strategy went really well. Yeah, and it did. It differentiated them from all the other bookstores, but it just, just didn't, wasn't enough to differentiate them from the online because the online was really addressing the pain a lot better. Newspaper stand. Do you remember the newspaper stands that used to be along King William Street? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah? They're not there anymore, mate. <laughs> <laughs> because people have an iPad. Like Sorry? Like <laughs> Crazy interwebs. Travel Agent Magazine it used to be a big magazine until. How do people go overseas now? How do you guys Web book your jet. trips? Webjet? Yeah. Easy jet. Easy jet. <laughs> <laughs> jet thing. <laughs> yeah, and how do you book your accommodation? Same place. Or you just search Google. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, what's happening here is there's a glo globalization going on at the moment. And globalization was talked about for ages, and everyone thought it was going to be really, really, really fun. And then everyone got really, really scared that these massive big companies were going to take over the world. And now they're just freaking out because. What's actually happened is neither of those things have happened. It's things just change ridiculously fast. Some big companies have gone out of business. Some little companies have got big. So what's happened to our technology sector? Where, where is our technology se sector situated now? So the button would have advanced 10, followed by now, wouldn't it? Do you mean Australia's? Yeah, Australia's. Yeah. Or ours here in Adelaide. When, where is that server? Well, you can cloud. It's in the cloud somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. So a lot of the stuff that used to be done locally is now being done in other countries, but also sometimes it's just being done in the ether. And what about manufacturing? What's happening there? Wow, well, outsourced. China, probably. Yeah. Has anyone read what, what's happening recently? The wages in China are going up, and now some things are being sourced back into the countries, but also just to other countries. Mm. Just not just China now, it's going to all different places, and it's a really open marketplace now for getting stuff made. Yeah. Yeah. 
Russia. Lots of different places are making stuff. Poland. Poland, absolutely. That's where IKEA makes lots of stuff. Yeah. And do, do you remember when you used to have to buy stuff? Yeah. <laughs> there used to be all this sort of stuff you had to buy. Like no. software and music and <laughs> movies and you know, basically anything that you wanted except food. So there's some real things that have really made a big change to a lot of businesses. And people weren't prepared for it. And he pointed us to this quote from Charles Darwin, which is, it's not the strongest who survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. And that's what today's presentation is really about, is that the companies which tend to survive aren't the ones which are the biggest or the ones with the best ideas. They're the ones that are able to respond to change the most quickly. And that's what the research from the guys at results.com found was the companies that were designed to be able to respond to change quickly tended to do better in the market than the big companies and the companies with really, really great ideas. So we've got some pretty good strategy in Griffin, is that fair to say? We have strategy days and have like a plan and all that sort of stuff. But the thing that makes strategies fail is execution. And so that's what we're going to be talking a lot about today, is what are the key elements of making sure that you can get your execution right. And we're not going to be looking at the nitty gritty of execution, we're going to actually be looking at the 26 areas, which if you've done clear and specific things in each of these areas, you should be able to execute correctly. So this is like a big long super checklist of if I'm expecting a team to win, have I given them all of the things and put in place all of the things that they need as their manager or their leader? And we're just going to have a bit of a think about that. And this is just a checklist. It's not to teach you to do anything or to get you to do anything now. It's really just to give you an idea of the sorts of things that you'd want to have in place if you're expecting a team to win. <clears throat> so I gave you two sheets. One says execution essentials assessment. So this is what you're going to do is have a think about your team or whichever level you want to think at, Griffin, Bakery, doesn't matter. But to have a think about these questions. But you'll also see there's a strategic execution plan, which looks not unlike a one-page plan. Um, and what results.com recommend is that you use this instead of a one-page plan because they think it captures the key elements in a better format. Um, whether it does or not. Is, is up to you. But this is just something that we'll be looking at. So the main thing that they're trying to do with this system is look at the 26 key areas of the business, but also to simplify the way that you're looking at it by breaking it up into five different levels um, of execution because the thing that they've noticed time and time again is that people try and go straight from vision and then to execution and they don't break it down into chunks and really think about which things are important at the different levels. So there's five pillars of execution that they like to think about, which is vision, strategy, engagement, accountability, and cadence. And what they did for us, and I'll send this to you after the lecture, is they gave us an assessment, which gave us a heap of information based on the answers that we gave on the execution essentials checklist of the things that our business might need to do. So I'll send you through that so you can have a look at it and keep it in mind as well. So the way that this presentation is, is designed is we simply go through the checklist and then you just decide whether for each of these questions you absolutely 100% agree that that is nailed and you can prove it or if everyone in the company agrees that it's a yes, then it's a yes. And if it's not, then it's a no and you put a little red mark next to it or a little cross or a tick on the ones that are in it or whatever. Basically, if it's a no, put a mark in the no column, you can see there, and if it's a yes, put a mark in the yes column. So the first pillar that we're looking at is the vision. So you can see he's circled here the area that we're talking about, right up in the top corner. So first thing to have a look at is core values. So, 
here's some core values for you. Communication, respect, integrity, and excellence. So that's Enron's core values. So one of the things that's important to think about is it's great to write down some core values, but the question is, do the core values embody what the people actually do in the company? <laughs> yeah. And so that's the question to ask yourself is, not only does your company have a list of core values or does your group that you're thinking about have a list of core values, but do the values actually represent what the business does? So he gave an example of some businesses that he, he felt did. So there's a company called Isaac. Um, so their core values, and they're a, they're a construction company, um, really reflect what they do. It's all about getting everyone home safe every night. And... He looked at another company. Um, yeah, we, you know, just a painting company. And really, really straightforward. Very, very basic core values. I was laughing at don't take the piss out of the person. Yeah, well, yeah. He talked a lot about that company, actually, and said it was really, really clear what people stood for. And when people, you know, took the piss, he said people were really on top of that. And said, if you want to take the piss... Work for any other construction company in the United States of America because that's all they ever do. But here, you don't take the piss <laughs> because it just doesn't work. And that's what differentiates working here from everyone else. So, core values is all about the why. Why are we doing what we're doing? And it's the bricks and mortar of your business. Here's a few other companies that uh, are pretty clear, challenge the status quo. That's why we buy these machines, isn't it? Not because they tend to work, they work sometimes. Mm -hmm. But it's all about not being Microsoft, pretty much. Mm -hmm. You know, well it has been for the last 10 years, I guess that will start to change now that they've got a bit more market share. Okay. Should be interesting. And these guys here, set a PC on every desk. That was a pretty good uh, goal. And he talked about this company called Rockstar Recipes. So they teach people how to play music. And apparently they've taught 20 million people how to do that. <laughs> Net-based company going, let's do that stuff. Here's another good one, Volvo. That's a pretty strong statement. <laughs> But it really sets their brand. Because no one wants to drive them. Yeah. Well, not no one. No one under 80, that's all. Sure. <laughs> no, no one. You still get all this boring. Yeah, that's what I mean. That, but that's their demographic. If you are boring, buy a car. If you're not, buy a different car. So, first thing on the execution essentials assessment is. Do you have a compelling, long-term, strategic vision that inspires your people? He's a guy that had a compelling, long-term, strategic vision and pretty much nothing else. Does anyone know who that is? Yeah, and what was his whole presidency about? Yeah. Does anyone know specifically what the vision was? Man on the moon before the Russians, wasn't it? Or man in space before the Russians? No, he actually said something which really got the whole nation behind him and really embodied what the US was about at the time, I think. He said the goal or the vision was to put a man on the moon and return him safely home, which really made a big difference because the Russians were just banging monkeys and people up into space and they were dying. <laughs> And they didn't really care because they just wanted to get people into space. But what made the difference and really united people around Kennedy and the space project wasn't getting a man to the moon. It was about putting someone on the moon and then getting them safely home. And it was the safely home that was actually the bit that really, I think, captured the people because it really differentiated what they were doing from what everyone else was doing, which was get stuff into space. So that united the people of the United States through some of their, you know, really, you know, there was a lot of tough stuff going on at that time, but that was enough to keep them united. So I'll ask the question again, 
Do you have a compelling long-term strategic vision that inspires your people? Yes or no? This is not an exam. It's just for something for you to think about with the people that you lead. This is the next question. Is your long-term strategic vision clearly visible to your people? And the example they gave is actually, this is a lady from Sydney who's in EO. Um, she runs a company. Has anyone heard of Red Bull and Dad? Yeah. Mm. Their, their original mission was to deliver one million experiences. And you can see here, can you see down here the people working? And the people up here. This is a big screen. Can you see the size of the people? Yeah. This is in their office. And every time someone books with Red Balloon, a balloon floats up and the number goes up. <coughs> and this is there every day when they work and they can see it. So this is an example of making their long-term strategic vision clearly visible to their people. Because their long-term strategic vision was get that number to one million. All the rest is great, but this is the this is the vision. A million experiences. Um, and they're going to they have a new one now because they did that. Um, in the process, she became the Australian Businesswoman of the Year and a few other things. Um, but she had a very, very clear long-term strategic vision, but the difference for her was she just communicated it so clearly to her people at all times. It was always there for her to see. So, to ask the question, is your long-term strategic vision clearly visible to your people, yes or no? So the next thing we'll home in on is core values. Are your core values clearly visible to your people? You just put up Results.com's core values. <coughs> People first, go the extra mile, live what we teach, abundance mentality, passion for learning and straight talk. So, with your team, are your core values clearly visible to your people? Yes or no? Have a think about it. And, and put the answer down so you can, so you can see. And the next thing to think about, um, are your core values incorporated into your recruitment and performance appraisal processes? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So when you hire someone, do you check whether they're a core value fit? And secondly, when you're reviewing someone's performance, does core value fit feature there? Yes or no? So the next question was, do you have a clear and compelling core purpose that explains why your company exists? So that's the first pillar. So that's the vision side of it. So that's the very big picture sort of stuff to think about. Um, the next thing to have a look at is strategy. So if you have a look on your strategic execution plan, now we're going down into the second half of, of, the, of the left side. So before we go through that, I just want to have a look at some myths versus facts. These guys looked at about, I think, 3,000 companies and they 
asked a whole series of questions about how these companies did things to find out what companies that win do. And they actually got some results which were pretty interesting, which they share with us, which I wanted to share with you today. So the guy who did this research is called Doug Hall. Sometimes he gets strangled by famous people. Um, what's the most effective company growth strategy, at least in their survey of 3,000 businesses, building customer loyalty or finding new customers? And it was really interesting. All of us said that customer loyalty was most important. But actually they found out that finding new customers was 2.8 times more effective at growing a business than from promoting loyalty with the existing customers. Which, especially for me, running a loyalty business was uh, pretty surprising and pretty confronting. They investigated the most effective revenue growth strategy and asked what creates the best growth strategy, increasing average dollars per sale or making people buy things more frequently. And they found that the businesses that were growing were the ones that increased the average dollar per sale. And that was nearly four times more effective to try and sell people more when they were buying than to try and cause them to purchase more frequently. This is for entrepreneurs. We were all complaining. <laughs> so the next thing was, what causes more sales using charts and graphs or using clear and simple words? And once again, I thought that pictures would have been a better way of demonstrating it, but actually they found that the companies that didn't have pictures that used clear, simple words were actually about twice as effective at creating sales as the companies that had pictures, like graphs and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and they felt that it was because there was a reduction in the amount of mental processing that was required. Then they looked at the company's credibility strat strategies and found the companies that were most credible and found out how they did their sales. And they asked whether or not the, credi the credibility was gained by testimonials from satisfied customers or product or service demonstrations. And they found that Demonstrations were forty-seven percent more effective than testimonials. With that, how, yeah. In our case, how would we demonstrate for that? For group, and what would be applied application of that? Um, this is why I say give the function DJs the tools that they need on the night to hook in functions. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's that's a product demonstration. Yeah, but um, more for like a new customer, a new one into the stream. That's yeah, and that's why I say our best way of creating new clients in terms of that is is referrals, is referrals. Um, bec and also doing correct follow up with venues that have a DJ booked. Yeah. Because you, that's the demonstration. The DJ performing is the demonstration, and so getting a DJ into a venue so that they can have a look at it associated with the correct sales follow up to me seems the most logical way of creating the demonstration. Unless, of course, someone wants to go down and DJ in an empty venue for an hour or something. It doesn't make sense. Which is why I really focus in on what functions have we got on and what are we doing about converting those venues into first call venues. Um, so, yeah, testimony was nowhere near as effective as demonstrations. This is the next thing is they found if your customers had to choose between a salesperson who was either highly dependable or highly competent that it was three times more important to people that people keep their promise than they have any idea what they were talking about in terms of whether or not they purchase something. Hmm. So remember they did over 3,000 businesses to have a look at this and what they were doing. And the companies that hired salespeople who simply kept their promises just made three times as many sales as the people who, the companies that hired people with specific skills, expertise in the area that they were selling. And this includes tech companies. Like, this is people selling, you know, a server that don't really know what the internet is. Mm. We're doing better if they just kept their promises and said, I don't know any about that, but I'll send you a thing back with a movie about it. And then they'd send the movie. That was more effective at getting someone to purchase than having all of the information, but not keeping the promises that were made. Then they had a look at the most effective growth strategy. And this was, do you expand your offering to serve different market segments or 
do you reduce your offering to focus on one market segment only? And they found that of all the companies that were around or had closed down, if you had only a single market segment that you were focusing on, you were 60% more likely to succeed than a company that had multiple market segments that they were serving. Here, look at the most effective marketing strategy. So, do you offer just one single benefit or did you have a look at every feature that you offer and list all of the benefits? And they found that companies who just marketed one single blunt benefit were 75% more likely to survive for longer than five years and 50%, 54% more likely to succeed than companies that listed a series of benefits of what they did. And the other thing that they found is if you have more, every benefit you have more than two significantly lowers your chance of success in business. So you have two if you must, but if you, add, if you have any more than two benefits, then your chance of failure just increases exponentially. And he alluded to having a company that's like a Swiss Army. <laughs> that don't work. So they had then had a look at how the customers communicated with uh, the companies communicated with their customers, and there were two types. There was the type of company that respected the customer's intelligence, and there was the type of company who would dumb down all of their marketing materials to the level of ten-year-olds. And the thing that they found was that companies that dumbed down their marketing to the level of a ten-year-old were actually seventy percent more effective. <laughs> It's what a lot of successful companies do. Hmm. And I quote, I want an A form for it. In unrelated news, they're selling some iPhones. Just putting it out there. I'm not saying, and this is the thing to get. I'm not saying that the iPhone is a better phone. But I know which company I'd want to have shares in. <laughs> So let's now have a look at our checklist now that we've had a bit of a think about this level that we're talking about, this strategy level. So sorry. the first question is, and we're looking at the at this strategic execution plan now is we're looking at the question of what does your company brand business <coughs> do? Now, what do Red Bull do? Does anyone know what Red Bull do? Yeah. They just give you energy. That's what Red Bull sells. One thing. They don't sell anything except energy. I mean, have a look at the can. Red Bull energy drink that's it there's no benefits except energy that's it and Einstein agrees <laughs> I thought that was pretty fun um, so the next thing thanks for that Dan I'll, I'll keep cracking though if you don't mind um, but if you want to bring that up at the end is that cool? Um, so the next thing um, having a look at was target market so you've got to really focus in so Apple's iPhone the target market was a mid 30s male who was an urban hipster that loves technology and wants to be seen as current and with it and shows off with his buddies with his buddies is that fair? Mm. none related news I own three <laughs> damn it Mission successful, Steve Jobs. Um, but then you've got to look at all the different companies and, and, and have a think about yeah, how any company really defines their market segment. So the next thing to look at is the need. 
And this was really, really cool. Prius. <coughs> they sold some of these. How good's the Prius? Shit. Yeah. That's yeah. coming from a Ford person. What about from a tech person? No. Shit. They're going to replace the batteries every day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm, what I'm, what I'm about to point out. Yeah? Petrol heads and, you know, tech yes. nerds agree. The Prius was a shit car. A so car. how did they sell them? It made it really obvious that you care about environment when you drive. Yeah. So you can advertise it to other people. Yeah. So what was the need that Prius were meeting with this car? Social proof that you care about the environment. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the need? Validation. That's what you bought when you bought a Prius. And people really hated how the Prius looked as well. <laughs> but do you know that Prius made the Prius look terrible and different on purpose? Because they needed people that bought the car to know that everyone would be able to recognise that it was a Prius. Because it looked different. And so that it looked very different to every other car on the market was very, very important yeah. for the Prius. So that's an example of really understanding the customer's greatest or deeper need. And you think about entering the car market, what are, who are, they, what are they competing against? People like me. <laughs> yeah. But don't give a shit. Yeah. That's, that's why I really it. But why do you buy the car? What's your greatest need with the car? Power, fast, how it is. And yeah. Why? Fuel economy comes into it, sort of. Oh, why? just because of the left foot and I like it and I get adrenaline rush on it. Yeah, exactly. So what's the actual deeper need? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Penis extension. <laughs> a bone. Oh, but no, you've, you've hit on one there, yeah? Uh, Some people buy the car as a penis extension, yeah? Yeah. 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 And that's the need there, is to have sex ever, maybe, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a huge market, yeah? For yeah. cars and for yeah. people generally. That's why I hold my cars. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, you were talking about you being a bit of a lead foot. What's the, what's the deeper need there? Satisfaction. I suppose. In what I'm way? You're testing it. Yeah. Speed, yes. Agree. Yeah. Need for speed. Some yeah. people just have this need for speed. You know, one of the people said, um, you know, he feels free mm. when he's in his car. The need for the freedom. Motorbike. You know, yeah, exactly. The need, yeah. So, yeah, exciting. There's, there's all these different needs, but can you see what Prius did was address a need that was so different from everyone else in the car industry at the time. So the only reason they sold cars was because they were the only people in the market that were addressing this particular need. Is it possible for that person to have both needs? Yeah. Because Russell Crowe's got one of them, but right next to it, he's got a Mustang as well. Yeah, exactly. So he's... There's, but the two, that's the whole point. It's just two totally different needs. So this was a way to demonstrate that you gave a shit about the environment everywhere you went. And that's what they were selling. And so they sold some cars. And it didn't matter that much that the car was kind of shit. Now, the next thing to look at is the key benefits. So there are functional, economic, and emotional benefits of any product. So let's have a look at the Harley-Davidson company and how they address... <laughs> The emotional needs of the clients. Can you read what that says? Yeah, I've never I'd never let my wife write it unless she, not until she's eighteen. <laughs> so, what's the emotional need, or what's the what's the key benefit? Pedophilia. Or the, sorry. Pedophilia. Well, what, what what what's this? What's this aimed at? Who are they selling the motorbike to here? Go on Who? And stay. Who? Bikies. No, they're not. This ad is not addressed towards bikies. Who is this addressed? Does anyone know? Guys that want to get away from their wife. Yep. Midlife crisis. Midlife crisis. Yep. This is particularly this ad is particularly addressed to people who are recently divorced. Yeah. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then they've got a whole separate stream of branding, which is the midlife crisis branding. This is their midlife crisis branding here. It's the same company. So can you see here? 
Mm. They're addressing emotional needs here. Yeah. yeah. Just got dumped by my wife. Just got a hot young new boyfriend. And I hate my job. So I might as well enjoy myself riding to and from it. You see Harley's part in, like, Perry Street. Mm. Like, lawyers that work 100 hours a week riding around on Harley. My boss in Queensland used to work up the work. Yeah, it's just like, wow. Mm. Figure your shit out. His wife was a bitch, so it yeah. makes sense. Yeah. But, um, there was one, um, I think, uh, Dodge or something, ran a his famous uh, Super Bowl ad once, where it was specifically in the ad they said, like, had like a husband who's like complaining about all the things he does as he's like chained by his wife. That's why I can drive this car. And yeah. they just actually just mm-hmm. put it out there and said, like, Do the sound of that. Like, do the sound of that. Yeah. 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 Pretty funny. Mm-hmm. And then they did one of the sponsors from GPS. That's one of the like, and the second day on the GPS. And the argument was like, we're going to try. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're really pissed off that. <laughs> so they obviously found some uh, emotional space in the market. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we might have liked it, but they still caused so much mistake. I wanted to get a brand out of it, and they definitely did. Yeah. Mm. Do you know how much that ad costs on the Super Bowl? To get the spot? Yeah. Like yeah, it's the most expensive. Mm-hmm. It's like $1.6 million or something yeah. for 30 seconds. It's like something ridiculous. Yeah, so it's got to be something pretty full on. So this is just talking about, about these key benefits. And, and what you're f- focusing in on from that is the brand promise. So you've got the functional, economic, and emotional parts of the brand promise. So, I won't talk about generation actually. So the first question is, and go to number six on your execution essentials assessment. The question is, do you have a documented strategic plan of the moves your company needs to make to successfully compete over the next three to five years? The next question is, have you documented the key characteristics of the target market customer for your brand? Do you know exactly what your ideal customer looks like? Like if they walk past you in the street, would you know, like, can you just look at people in the street and go, that's our customer, that's not our customer, that's not our customer, that's our customer. Do you know what they look like, how they behave, how you can tell them from people that are not your customer? Sorry? Not documented. Very wordy in these things. And here's a comment from Phil Curler, which is there is only one winning strategy, and that's carefully define the target market and, di- and direct a superior, superior offering to that target market. That's potentially the only way to win in business. Intentionally. Yeah. You could win accidentally. Mm-hmm. So, the next question is, does your brand have a clear positioning statement? And here's a comment from Seth Godin. If you can't state your position in eight words or less, you don't have a position. Can anyone state their position? What, what do you, um, sorry, what do you mean by position statement? So it's kind of like your brand promise. Like, when someone says, what does your business do? Or what do you do? What do you say? Uh, yeah, yeah. Does anyone have something that they say? I don't know what I say for now. It's just that you give them peace of mind in terms of making sure they enjoy their night without stressing them. We we come along the lines of put a high quality product out in the shop for you to be able to take home to you that you'd want to give to your family. Because yeah, one of our targets are our housewives. Mm. Yeah. 
Spanish hockey people in that show are special. Especially the guy from the dual game. Thank you. You make customized new tools. Yeah. <laughs> DJ's thing is yeah, offering, making sure we like a special guest night. That's what the way I see it. Uh, we have to load it up, you know. It's not funny. It's not funny. Cool. So, he gave a bit of an analysis of 1 800 got junk. Their position is the world's largest junk removal service. You know, he looked at results.com, they're the business execution experts. So, yeah, have a look at that question. Does your brand have a clear positioning statement? Yes or no? Oh, that was fun. What did I do then? Uh huh? No, I don't know what I did then, but that was cool. Okay. Um, the next question. Do you have a clear and compelling promise for your brand? Red Bull does. What's the promise? What do you get if you drink Red Bull? Yeah. Has anyone actually grown wings by drinking Red Bull? Well, no, you drink Red Bull and Bushel, right? It does feel like got wings. Yeah. Hmm. But it's a pretty clear... Brand promise. And 1-800 Got Junk's got a pretty clear brand promise, which is circled there at the top. Remove your junk without lifting a finger. That's pretty clear. So the question is, does your company or your team or your brand have a clear and compelling promise like that? <coughs> the thing that you promised the customer. Next question is your positioning statement and brand promise clearly and consistently stated in all of your client facing communications? So this is asking whether the statement that you've got and your brand promise is clearly and consistently stated in all of your client facing communications. Clear and consistent. So this is Simon's business card, that's the front and this is the back. This was kind of cool, he pointed out. You can't tell from 90% of people's business cards what they do. Mm -hmm. There's his. Let me show you you how we transform your business potential into extraordinary results. So, is your positioning statement and brand promise clearly and consistently stated in <coughs> all of your client facing communication? All right. Let's move on to the next pillar, engagement. So this is now we're starting to dig down and get to the interface between all of the corporate ideas and now starting to get down to people actually maybe doing something. But if they're not engaged, nothing happens. So looking at different types of people and how they fit into your business and who you want and what types of people you need more and less of and looking at actually how to have productive people. And this is something to really think about is that productive people are happy, but the thing that was pointed out is that progress is the number one motivator in a work environment. It's not back rubs and lollies anywhere near as much as it's mm. getting a goal, nailing that goal and going, wow, we did that, what's next? That the number one motivator for people in a business is actually making progress, visible, clear, stated progress, particularly if it's been stated beforehand. So now we're heading right down the sheet and we're looking down way on the other side. So 
this bit down here. Starting to get right down into the into the nitty gritty of the sheet now. So results.com have this thing called a chief execution officer, and they've got this computer program that allows you to manage all of this side of the sheet, which is kind of pretty cool. It's not that expensive either. It's a bit expensive, but it's affordable. So this is does this look familiar? Mm -hmm. Cool. So we are getting something right. Um, he was talking about productivity and asking how many of the people on your team <laughs> would love this cartoon. <laughs> yeah. So he said, if you don't have. <laughs> 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 He said, if you don't have engagement, if you don't specifically have engagement in your staff, this is what you have. So unless you can specifically demonstrate engagement in your staff, this is what you have. I did nothing today and I still got paid. And that looks like that. <laughs> so you have to be careful. Because you can have happy people in your business, but it's not going anywhere. So... First question, can all of the people on your team recite your positioning statement and brand promise? Yes or no? Remember, this is about engagement of your team. This is really big for me because I saw this as just a part of the strategy. But as he pointed out, this is engagement. This is not to do with strategy. Strategy is one thing, and then getting people to know what strategy is is, the, is a completely separate level of what you're doing. It's a separate task. So can all of your people recite your positioning statement and brand promise? And the next question, can all of your people recite your core values? Can anyone recite all of their core values to their team or their group or their business or what they're thinking about today? We can't go. I mean, our team, I think we've got a team. All of your people recite your core values for your team. Well, if whatever team you're thinking about, does your team know what the their, the core values of that team are and can they recite them? That's the question. And the next question is: Do you use behavioural profiling tools to assess the strengths of all of your team members? Disc, Myers Briggs, anything, any behavioural profiling tool. The next question is Are your teams highly functional? And this probably needs a little bit of explanation. So, when you're talking about the five dysfunctions of a team, Patrick, Lin, Tien, Ernie, can you see that most of this is stuff we've already learned about at some stage? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So this is a, a congealing or a congealing, you know, an aggregation of a whole lot of different things. Um, when you're talking about functionality, you're talking about trust, management of conflict, creation of commitment willingness to take on accountability and attention to results. And the real focus is results. Does your team focus on getting a result? Do they drive accountability? Do they commit to a decision? Are they productive in conflict situations? <coughs> and at the end of the day, do they trust each other?
So, based on that, do you consider that your team is highly functional or would they all agree that their team is highly functional? And the final one, which was really, really interesting, because remember, all of these questions came from analysing businesses and going, which are the successful ones and how do they do it? And which are the ones that have either shut down or are really unsuccessful going backwards? And what do they do? And what are the things that are significantly different between those two sets of businesses? And one of the things they found is that successful businesses measured employee engagement every six months. So the question is, do you measure employee engagement every six months? And the way that he recommends... To measure that is net promoter score. What would be the question for measuring engagement as a net promoter score question? Can anyone think of what that question, how you would ask that question? Measuring employee engagement in your company as a net promoter score question. How would you ask that question? Any ideas, Dan? Um, I was thinking maybe... Um I can't remember exactly what the format of it was, but uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, how uh, what's it? if someone wanted to join Griffin, how would you, um, how, how likely would you be to refer us to them? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. Basically, for someone new to come into the company, how, how um, often do you recommend people to join our business? Yeah, on a scale of 1 to 10... How likely are you to recommend Griffin as a place to work? How likely would you be to recommend someone work here? On a scale of one to ten. That's the net promoter score question. Pretty straightforward. And as most of us that have studied net promoter score know, zero to six is a detractor. In the middle is seven to eight, and the promoters are the nines and tens. And from that, you get a team engagement score. So the question remains, do you measure employee engagement every six months? How are people feeling about all these questions? The bakery is dismal and trying out a lot. Looking at it from the department point of view, we're pretty abysmal. <coughs> the company point of view is slightly different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, yeah, it's just a company by thing for every third department either. Mm. So, wh wherever you're at, don't worry. Yeah? Just have some courage and just get in there. Don't worry too much because. Remember that what they've done is they've looked at some businesses, a heap of them, and they're really looking at what the top, top performing businesses are doing. And this is not about, this is not a test and go, you're a good business or a bad business or a good, you're a good leader or a bad leader. This is about increasing your awareness about what sort of things you can do as a leader that are going to make a big difference to your team. So, yeah, just trying to, just trying to keep it positive. So, let's have a look at accountability now. <laughs> This is the Griffin accountability system here. <laughs> so here's some interesting stats that they got. Only 15% of employees know their company's top priorities. And only 6% know their own individual priorities. And this was just a general survey of a whole lot of employees. And 32% of employees doubt there is a plan at all. So that's, uh, that's the base level you're working from. So that's why I was saying don't beat yourself up too much. <laughs> because this is the reality of workplaces, at least in the US. And only 27% believe they're fully prepared, prepared for the challenges they will face in the coming year. So about 27% of them think they can win in 12 months.
So the thing that he looked at next was personal dashboarding and keeping people online with KPIs. And this is an area where I think we've made good progress. Um, and it's something that they really focused in on a lot. Is if there's someone on your team that doesn't have clear and specific targets, and if they don't know how those targets relate to at least the next level above them and the overall goals of the company, it's very, very ambitious to expect that they'll intentionally do anything to move you towards your goal. They might sort of accidentally or by figuring it out by osmosis, but that won't be because of something that you did as their boss. So, looking at accountability, the first question is, does your company have a clearly documented strategic action priorities list to implement this quarter? And here's this quote from the boss of GE. Every leader needs to clearly explain the top three things the company is working on. If you can't, you're not leading well. So this is looking on that execution, strategic, strategic execution plan. This is looking at the 90 day action priorities and saying set three. And the thing that he pointed out is that the thing that he pointed out and the thing to remember is that the people who plan the fight don't fight the plan. And that's something to be very, very aware of. Is that our frontline staff aren't here. They don't make the plan, but we ask them to fight to it. And so you have to remember that if there's not some very, very clear priorities, then you just got a whole group of Indians running around with sticks. So the question remains. Does your company have clearly documented strategic action priorities to implement this quarter? Yes or no? <coughs> the next question is, do you measure the small handful of key performance indicators number key key performance indicator numbers every week that predict the future success of your business? So do you measure the small handful of key performance indicator numbers every week that predict the future success of your business? Yes or no? And the next thing to think about is, do you use a dashboard to make your key performance indicators visible every single week? It just says visible. Next question, have you clearly documented who is accountable for the key functional roles in your business and how their success will be measured? So if you've got a team, then it's talking about at the level of your team. Do you have, a clear, do you have clearly documented who is accountable for the key functional outcomes of your team? And how their success will be measured. Is that clear? So here's an example. Head of the company is responsible for net profit percentage. Head of marketing leads per month, etc., um, etc. Et 
Head of Finance, Accounts Receivable Days. Head of Operations. Oh, average client longevity, how long people stay on board for. Let's just some examples. But this is what a dashboard would look like, at least for a whole company, if it was clearly done. They've got here who it is, the KPI, and the targets. Red, yellow, green. Yep. So, have you clearly documented who is accountable for the key functional roles in the business <coughs> and how the success will be, will be measured? Yes or no? <clears throat> So, the next thing is about consequences. And this is Peter Drucker. Does anyone know what Peter Drucker is about? Yeah. He's a pretty interesting fella. So he's sort of like the grandfather of modern business. He just cruised around and made lots of grumpy statements about how things should be. Sorry? Yeah. What Drucker had to say about dealing with non-performance is, leaders owe it to the organisation and to their fellow workers not to tolerate non-performing people in important jobs. Which I think is a very polite way of saying something which is pretty full on. Hmm. Sorry? It's an interesting little Griffin. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably what I think it says. Hmm. Yep. You might have noticed a fair bit of change in the composition of the executive team over the last two years. Um, and this is a guide to how to deal with non-performing people in your team. Well, yeah, yep. <laughs> so the question is do your staff know the consequences for achieving or not achieving the performance standards required for their role every quarter and that's not just the downside it's the upside as well do they, they know what the rewards or the penalties are for getting a certain level of performance is that clear Yes or no? And the final question was, do you follow a proven recruitment process to ensure you only employ A players? A quick review of what an A player looks like. Has everyone seen this graph before? Do they live the core values or not? And do they exceed the performance standards required or not? So if they live your core values and they exceed their performance standards, they're an A player. If they live the core values but they don't get their standard, then they're a B player. If they don't live the core values, they're a sleep bar, whether they meet the measures or not. Is that B player at the top left? Though? Sorry? Is that B at the top left? Um, yeah, that's a B player there. So yeah. they, they're excited what they're doing, but they're not in the core values. Yeah. So what do you do with people in these two columns here? Screen, they screen yeah. So you get rid of these people. What about these people? What do you do with these people? Mm -hmm. Yep, train them to be A players. And what do you do with these play players? Alright. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't have to promote them, but you have to reward them. Because not all of them want to be promoted. 
but they all want to be rewarded and also you've got to reward that because that sends a message to everyone. If you don't reward the A players, then people are confused about what A player looks like. So here's a proven process for getting A players. Um, on average, about 25% of people are A players. So if you've got 25% A players in your company, that's just because you're hiring people that are alive. But if you use a top grading process, then you can lift that to 90%. And that can make a fairly significant difference to your charts of success. So the question remains, do you follow a proven recruitment process to ensure you only employ A players in your team? Because they found the companies that do. So we're nearly there. Um, the final thing we're looking at is cadence. So does anyone understand what cadence is? Rhythm, yeah, rhythm. <clears throat> so, cadence isn't a separate thing. Cadence is how you tie the vision, the strategy, the engagement, and the accountability together into a rhythm. I like holding clouds in my fingers. Mm. Um, so, the first question is, has your strategic plan been updated in the last 90 days for your team? Have you got together with them and updated the strategic plan? That's a fun picture. That's how we equip some of our team members to deal with their jobs. <laughs> the next question is, do you conduct well-structured execution meetings with your team members on a weekly basis? So this is asking whether or not every single member of your team is involved in a meeting in which they can specifically create actions for the following seven days every single week. They found an uncanny correlation between companies that did this and companies that still existed in five years. So yes or no for that? The next question, do you hold your team members accountable <coughs> for execution progress every single week? So do you then take the things that they said they were going to do from the week before and do you check publicly in with them with the rest of the team about whether they did that or not? And they've got a great way that they do that in this system. Because they found that companies that checked on whether people had actually done what they said they were going to do somehow did better. Second to last question. Are core values stories included as an agenda item at every weekly meeting? Even they were surprised to see this come up. But they noticed that the best companies did this in their meetings every single week. The companies that were most successful every week highlighted core value stories in their weekly meetings. They set between one and two minutes aside every week just to highlight something that someone had done in the last seven days that was a core value match. So these are the role models in the company. Do you highlight them? That's the question. Are core value stories included as an agenda item at every weekly meeting? And the final question, do you review and debrief the execution of your strategic action priorities at the end of every quarter? 
Do you review and debrief the execution of your strategic action priorities at the end of every quarter? A quarterly review. So that's your execution essentials and basically what we've gone through today is if you paid people at Harvard half a million dollars, they would spend four years getting you to understand this in a lot, a lot of detail. And then they would put you in a company like General Electric and give you a business to run. I hope that you survive. Um, so... These 26 questions really form the underpinning of any business or any team that's able to execute successfully. And I apologise if today's content was pretty dry, but the reality is this is the top-down overview of making any team work. So it kind of is pretty dry. It's a checklist. If you do these 26 things, then... Science predicts that you will probably win. And if you do some of these, then science predicts that you might win. And if you don't do any of these, then you're going to die. In business. Mm. Um, this is not an academic list. This is not Peter Drucker getting up on his high horse and yelling at people and pointing a finger. This is just, they looked at 3,000 businesses and just went, what do you do? Okay, now how successful are you? And they just looked at what the businesses that were successful were doing and the ones that weren't and it didn't just went, one of these things is not like the other. So this is a pretty, this is a checklist that you can rely on to be a pretty reliable indicator of success in your terms. So that's the end of the form part of the presentation. And what I wanted to do is leave half an hour now for us to discuss this and now we can delve into what people think about it. And... Have a bit of fun with people like, people like that.